Hello, everyone. May I bring us back to order? Thank you. Uh, welcome to our second panel. Uh, despite what the program claims, I am not, in fact, Ethan Lasser. Uh, I instead am Amy Torbert, uh, and I'm the current curator Mayor Curatorial Fellow in American Art here at the Harvard Art Museums. And I have the pleasure of welcoming you to our second panel. Titled Rooms for Making, it brings together an 18th century British library, a 19th century Japanese college, and a late 20th century American biosphere. Though this panel risks disorientation through its geographical and chronological breadth, we hope that it exemplifies the curiosity and wonder that animated both the philosophy chamber and the act of learning more generally. Two further threads connect these papers. First, the spaces in question were not exactly those where the sausage gets made, if you get my drift. Instead, they are the places that fostered the production of knowledge as well as things. And second, that the arts and sciences are not and never were diametrically opposed foes. Instead, the subjects and methods of these papers demonstrate the value of disciplinary connectedness. I'll briefly introduce our panelists, but I remind you to consult your programs for fuller biographies. Our first speaker is Matthew Hunter. He is an associate professor in the Department of Art History and Communication Studies at McGill University, and he will deliver a paper titled A Scene in a Library, Inventing and Destroying Enlightenment Photography at Soho House. The second speaker will be Matthew Mullane, a PhD candidate in the School of Architecture at Princeton University. He will present a paper titled Connected Interiors, Learning Architecture and Observation in Meiji, Japan. And finally, uh, Meredith Sattler will wrap up the panel. She is an assistant professor of architecture at the California Polytechnic State University, San Luis Obispo. Her paper is titled, Interior as Microcosm, the Production of Epistemologies, Ethics, and Identities at Biosphere 2, 1991 to 94. Please join me in welcoming our first speaker. I hand you this assurance that I shall take no notice whatever of any further correspondent, correspondence which you may address to me. So declared Francis Pettit Smith, engineer of screw-propelled steamships, curator of London's Patent Museum in late February 1864. Smith was then attempting to remove himself from an acrimonious dispute, a dispute over artifacts he had unearthed from the Birmingham factory of 18th century industrialist Matthew Bolton, a dispute over evidence appearing to move the invention of photography in both space and time. For in the fall of 1862, Smith had traveled to Birmingham, hoping to acquire an early prototype of James Watt's steam engine, which we see at left. Amidst the crumbling walls of Bolton's Soho manufactory, Smith met an agent of the Bolton family named Edward Price. As Price would then subsequently tell it, he had produced from the library at Soho House a folio in which Smith discovered these sun pictures and begged them of me. Sun pictures, that was the phrase used in the 1860s to describe the array of images that we see here. Acquired by Smith for London's Patent Museum, these images would get Edward Price fired, ruined financially, literally run out of England. They would lock Francis Pettit Smith into pitch battle with an unlikely foe. Unlikely because there was no greater enemy to these sun pictures, to the assertion that they shifted credit for photography's invention away from Louis Daguerre or William Henry Fox Talbot around the Annus Mirabilis of 1839 and back to 1780s, Bir 1780s Birmingham. No greater foe than Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton, the Soho industrialist's own grandson. But why was M.P. W. Bolton so opposed to the sun pictures? If nothing else, what drove him to deny awarding photography's invention to his namesake? Now, it's hard to cram the world into a room and harder still to stuff my story into 15 minutes, so I'll be ruthless. If the works that Smith amassed look to us now like a heterogeneous lot, 
uh, with the five objects here classed now by the London Science Museum as mechanical paintings, others called stipple engravings after Angelica Kaufman, and a now lost um, silver plate depicting Soho House before its architectural renovation, which we see through a print hand toned in the upper right hand corner. Um, we need to recall that all were then understood in the 1860s to derive from 1780s efforts by Bolton and Watt to replicate oil paintings by chemo mechanical means. All were then sun pictures. But how did those 1780s sun pictures relate to sun pictures in the 1860s to what inheritors of Nisiphor Nepce's heliographs or Sir David Brewster's talk of drawing by the agency of light had come to call photographs? That is what the 1860s debate appears to be about. I take a different view. Borrowing my title from Talbot's paranoid episode in The Pencil of Nature, where actions of unsuspecting agents in a darkened library register to a hidden camera eye, I use Edward Price's own manic visions of the Soho library in which these sun pictures were found to argue for a different chamber, the combustion chamber, as the debate's organizing motor. Imagining Soho Library that way helps us to enfold academic oil paintings and their replicas, calotypes, steam engines, and combustion-driven airplanes into a history of what I call temporally evolving chemical objects. And just as photography is a subset episode, not culminating telos of that history, so Smith's quest for engines amidst Soho Library helps us to rethink Talbot's own engines. Now, what we know of Edward Price, who claimed to have worked at the Soho Manufactory, is sketchy. Claimed to have worked there since the 1830s. Over the winter of 1862 to 3, he proved supremely skillful, however, in sourcing startling artifacts from the dilapidated factory. A chance encounter with a Birmingham auctioneer reminds him that, quote, some years ago, I turned out all the rubbish and waste paper from the library at Soho House. This auctioneer bought the old scrap paper, and amongst it was a very curious picture, which he says is neither chalk, crayon, Indian ink, print, or painting. As Price tries to track down the camera that supposedly made these strange images, other volunteers contact curator Smith, eager to share instruments vaguely remembered, practices putatively employed at Soho half a century earlier. These acts of memorialization surely speak to a period perception that a steam engine driven industrial present was separated from the 18th century by a widening gap. And Birmingham had felt those gaps acutely. The city had become a site of intensive union organizing after the economic slump of the 1820s and Chartist riots in 1839, even as its city center was rebuilt around Watt steam engine technology. And the Soho manufactory itself destroyed in 1863. For Price, writing on the wrong side of Birmingham's bullring riots, with the benevolent industrial paternalism he associated with the first Matthew Bolton, replaced by Victorian boosters' bureaucratized schemes, that forgetfulness was hardly accidental. For, for the Soho Price imagines is something worthy of Lunar Society associate Joseph Wright of Darby. As with Wright's Alchemist of 1771, and I'll spare you the entire title of this picture, which is like a novel, Price's Bolton and Watt commanded technologies of unearthly power. Price claims that the sun pictures had been made during the Lunar Society meetings in a dark tent, and there was nothing to be seen except a picture on the table. By some process, they secured this shadow." Unquote. Moreover, that library where the sun pictures were made was itself a Masonic temple. Quote, when we pulled down the old library upon the plaster, I found traces of the emblems of masonry. There was East Delta over C and other signs, but of course, you not being a mason, I cannot explain more. <laughs> and powerful artists had long stood opposed to these sun pictures. After painting Bolton's portrait in the 1790s, which we see here on the right, so Smith declares, uh, so uh, Price declares, 
Sir William Beechey, whose self-portrait we see on the left, went among all the artists and got up a petition to Matthew Bolton and the Lunar Society begging them to stop because the secret would, if made known, be the means of shutting up the painter's shops." Unquote. Now, delusional as Price sounds here, his fears would prove entirely justified once Smith presented his research to the Photographic Society of London in late 1863. There, Smith's claims for the sun pictures as early photographs convinced many. Photographer George Shadbolt, whose 1857 albumen silver print we see here, was persuaded by this now lost silver plate depicting the Soho Library. Examining it carefully with a lens, quote, he was assured that it was a camera image from nature which took back the invention of photography to a period before 1791. If others were more skeptical, a nationalistic British press loved this story. Against French priority, one paper crowed, Birmingham may claim the honor of being the first place in which the art of photography was discovered and first practiced. And less than a week after his public presentation, Smith's findings were read by Matthew Pierce Watt Bolton. Born in 1820, raised on an 8,000 acre estate in Oxfordshire, educated at Eton and Cambridge, MPW Bolton would seem to cut the very figure of the Victorian country gentleman. Initially, Bolton assented to Smith's claims. If his intelligent and useful servant Price had likely missed some of the key details. Bolton then argued, quote, the pictures made at Soho by the secret method practiced there were produced in some way by the agency of light, unquote. But Bolton quickly changes his tune. His 1864 remarks concerning certain photographs supposed to be of early date accuses Price of stealing money from the Soho operation. He charges embezzlement of upward of a thousand pounds, and he douses cold water on Smith's story. Methods of replicating academic paintings developed by his grandfather were, he now asserts, mechanical, but those techniques were probably widely different from photography, and their products were never described as sun pictures. Further, after delegating agents to interrogate octogenarians surviving in Greater Birmingham, Bolton charges that the building depicted in the lost silver plate, which again we see on the right, was neither Soho Library nor was the plate old. Rather than being made during the 1780s by his grandfather through some otherwise mysterious technique in the very library in which it would ultimately be found, the silver plate was now credited to his aunt working in the 1840s with bog standard daguerreotype techniques and depicting a different building entirely. So splitting metal and paper apart, dismissing the former as photographic but not ancient, the latter is from the 18th century but not photographic, sun pictures qua photographs had effectively ceased to exist. But what if we were to release the sun pictures from photography's grasp? Remember that Francis Pettit Smith had gone to Soho in 1862 to find a prototype of James Watt's steam engine an instrument that recent history of science compels us not to see as an anticipation of thermodynamics, but as a contribution to the history of chemistry. Smith had no small interest in Watt. Best known for his practical advances in screw-propelled steamships, Smith was not only likened to Watt by contemporaries, but his engineering achievements would be praised by Bolton himself in the very Sun Pictures pamphlets otherwise assailing Smith's judgment. And in fact, just as he was scuppering the sun pictures in the 1860s, Bolton was making patent applications of his own, patents on airplane ailerons that continue to figure in histories of aeronautics. In his remarkable On Aerial Locomotion, also of 1864, Bolton describes the novelty of his airplanes like this, quote, earlier projectors in the art of flight principally aimed at imitating the wings of birds but since the use of the screw propulsion of steamboats, the employment of a similar propeller for, the aerial, for aerial locomotion naturally suggests itself. Propelled then by the screw mechanism, he knew to be the product of Smith's hard, unremunerated graft, Bolton's aircraft faced a crucial challenge. 
How could an engine generate sufficient power to lift the plane off the ground? Acknowledging the example of Watt's steam engine, Bolton pleads for chemical research on new chemical explosives. Yet already in 1864, so the second year of his son picture's pamphleteering, Bolton located a highly promising compound, gun cotton. Quote, a suitable quantity of the gun cotton being introduced into a chamber near the cylinder and there ignited, the gas thus generated would rush into the cylinder and work the piston, just as is done by steam to communicate a rapid rotation to an aerial propeller. What I'm showing you here is one of his uh, patent specifications, this one from 1868. Of course, the compound that Bolton had called out for combustion engine research then stood at a cutting edge of photographic technology. Gun cotton or nitrocellulose was mixed with ether and alcohol to form collodion, cornerstone of the wet collodion process popularized by Frederick Scott Archer by 1851. Now, more needs to be said than I can do in my remaining time about how Bolton's repurposing of the chemical accelerants of photographic modernity informed, in fact, drove his fight with Smith. But Bolton's most important precedent in such campaigns was surely when William Henry Fox Talbot himself. For during the frantic years of his calotype production in the early 1840s, Talbot was also obtaining patents for electrical and gas engines, which too would use, or would come to use, gun cotton as a combustible propellant. Now, what might all of this tell us? Academic oil paintings and their replicas, calotypes, combustion-driven airplanes, that array looks strange if we think that the camera obscura is the chamber that matters here. But my argument is that we need to defamiliarize, or better, dissolve photography, to shift this target of investigation. The sun pictures are not proto-photographs. They are moves in a history of making and thinking with chemicals valued for enacting new kinds of motion in space and time. Arch capitalist Milton Friedman once described economists' notoriously stylized models as providing an engine to analyze the world, not a photographic reproduction of it. Extracted from the Soho Library, the sun pictures turn Friedman's terms around. They challenge us to parse the historical trajectories of chemical research shared between the camera and the combustion chamber, between photography, painting, and devices of motive force modeled after the steam engine. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you again. I'd like to thank all the participants and particularly people on my panel. I really look forward to discussing uh, the linkages that were pointed out earlier. It's I think it's a really exciting panel. Um, I would like to begin today in the two-story atrium of the Imperial College of Engineering, the Kobu Daigaku, Japan's first modern college of science opened in 1873. A quick glance at the room offers few details that would give away its location in Tokyo. The Renaissance and neoclassical ornamental touches, the thin iron supports, the coffered ceilings, all elements meant to signify the successful transport of Western science to Japan after the 1868 Meiji Restoration. On the floors and balconies are piles of teaching objects, desks, glass vitrines, wooden cabinets, and rows of foreign books, all similarly arranged to impress international visitors and immerse Japanese students uh, and foreign dignitaries alike in equal measure. Many of the objects spill over from the university's so-called technical museum, a room that the school's principal, Henry Dyer, prized as the most important on campus because it provided students of any specialization the opportunity to look at and touch the objects of industrial modernity. And these included machines, scientific instruments, and even architectural models. He claimed that, quote, the material elements of education enormously accelerate the progress of the pupil. The two words, look there, are often more valuable than an hour's lecture. The pupil takes into his mind the form, color, meaning of the thing itself, which no words could give him. And in good collections of this sort, the insides of things are shown him clearly as the outsides, so that the pupil's knowledge is thorough instead of merely skin deep. 
My presentation today approaches our shared theme of interiors to ask about interiority and further ask how and why students at Japan's premier college of science learned about the insides of things and in so doing also learned to connect the discipline of architecture to a larger system of knowledge. The Imperial College of Engineering was a pioneering collaboration between the Japanese Ministry of Public Works, headed up by Yamo Yozo, and European Oyatoi, or imported specialists who are contracted to move to Japan, teach, and oversee the country's institution building following the 1868 Meiji Restoration. The goal was to give Japan not only a polytechnic university, uh, but also an engine of endogenous modernization. It had a cutting edge curriculum and produced students skilled in techniques that a rapidly industrializing country needed, including civil and mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, shipbuilding, chemistry, metallurgy, mining, and architecture. And at the bottom, we see the logo of the school, the Japanese character ko, uh, meaning building. And despite this kind of um, logoed appeal to Japanese, all the classes uh, for the first session of the school's existence were taught in English. And it deserves further note that in Japanese, many of these terms did not have a uh, solid definition. Architecture, for instance, would not have a solid Japanese term until roughly the 1890s. Instead, it kind of existed in a cloud of related terms associated with house building, palace building, uh, craft work, et cetera, et cetera. The polytechnic model and its array of disciplines was attractive to pro-modernization intellectuals in Japan because it was firstly committed to the pragmatism, uh, or jitsugaku, which is a, a common keyword uh, in major Japan, uh, the pragmatism of state building. And secondly, it instantiated a crucial principle of positivistic Western thinking, the connectedness of disciplinary knowledge. And perhaps the most prominent booster of this idea uh, uh, was Nishi Amane, the writer, teacher, and lecturer who, in 1870, gave a famous talk called Hyakugaku Renkan, a subtitled encyclopedia. Um, the term itself translates literally to the links to all sciences. Influenced by thinkers like Comte and Mille, uh, the talk was dedicated to describing the simultaneous distinction and unity of Western disciplines and how positive knowledge linked it all. The talk's scribbled preparatory notes show Nishi trying to work out these connections, jotting in a mixture of Japanese and English loose constellations of disciplines scattered around the page. The cloud of terms is a game of proximity where relations amongst similar fields of study or, in this case, some prominent thinkers are drawn out. We see on the left, orology and geology linked by a line, alchemy and chemistry hover near each other, uh, Linnaeus and Cuvier commingle at the top. On another page, amongst several arts, including painting, poetry, and sculpture, and even more technical terms like machinery, technology, engineering, and metallurgy, we see architect. For Nishi, architecture, in particular Western architecture, was not only another discipline in this uh, blurred field, it was a physical manifestation of the symmetrical, rational, and systematic nature of Western thinking. In the same lecture, he argues that, quote, in architecture, or in the words of builders, symmetry is the work of organizing in kind. This organizing of likenesses based on commonalities extends from erecting the walls of the house, from its foundation, and to the roof. This is building according to truth. In other words, the process of bringing together likenesses in a totalizing architectural composition from the smallest detail to the entirety of the building itself matched his larger project of arranging similar fields of thought into a coherent system. And this use of architecture as a metaphor for Western modernity continues throughout much of the Meiji period, related not only to form, style, and arrangement, but also uh, the materials of architecture itself, including most of all brick and iron, which become common metaphorical materials of the modernization process. The Imperial College of Engineering manifested this ideal of truth symmetry in two senses, by first bringing together specialized multidisciplinary education under one roof, in doing so inside a symbol of the symmetry, 
a campus designed by the French uh, hired architect and instructor, uh, C.A. Chastel de Boinville. Uh, he also taught some of the first architecture classes at the university before being summarily fired. Um, his contract was not renewed, uh, according to student reports, because he was mean and because they could not understand his French accent. Uh, the complex's Beaux-Arts symmetry was like the very ideal of positivistic knowledge itself, more easily realized on paper than as planned. The proposed Western Wing was scrapped uh, to shuttle students into classrooms as soon as possible. And this mania for symmetry, frustrated by uh, a reality of quick modernization, is captured again in Boinville's drawing for the main interior hall, a single point perspective sketch of a completely symmetrical space, uninterrupted by the kinds of bothersome teaching objects and books that would soon crowd the floor. Looking at the floor plan, this modernizing commitment to connection is spatially manifested as a system of hallways linking experimental laboratories, apparatus rooms, museums, drawing ateliers, and so forth. The school's principal, Henry Dyer, the aforementioned uh, Scotsman, admitted that the design was inspired by the ETH in Zurich, the premier polytechnic school of its kind in Europe designed by Gottfried Zemper. Though coming from a Swiss source, this kind of pedagogical spatialization was not totally alien in Japan at the time. Samurai schools of the previous Tokugawa era, for example, like the pictured Nishinkan, were organized in a similarly symmetrical fashion and grouped many different sciences around a holistic curriculum. And it was a curriculum that included not only uh, heavy textual analysis, which is very typical of Confucian and Neo-Confucian education, but also um, observation of nature, uh, which was exercised in the upper left um, at uh, an observatory platform. However, the key difference between these two buildings is not the physical space between classrooms, but the epistemological values connecting them. Where samurai schools place Confucian teachings at the center of their education, represented literally often by a statue of Confucius, the Imperial College of Engineering placed inductive thought, natural philosophy, and scientific observation at its core. All students at the uh, Imperial College of Engineering were required to devote two years out of their six total years of coursework in the Eastern Wing of the school, where they sat in lectures on natural philosophy, witnessed demonstrations of scientific phenomena, completed their own experiments in the laboratories, and spent time in the Technical Museum. And many of these experiments would have been known to the more learned societies in Japan at the time, and often they included very rudimentary scientific demonstrations and experiments using Leiden jars and uh, flame cotton, et cetera. Before architects were permitted to start designing buildings and making architecture, they had to learn how to observe in the lab. And the exact layout of these rooms is a little bit mysterious. No photographs of them in use survive. And the only evidence we have today is how the college's inheritor, the Imperial University of Tokyo, here pictured about two decades later, uh, which is today the Contemporary University of Tokyo, uh, how they used the college's objects after they inherited them in its own apparatus room about a decade later. However, we do know the contents of the Technical Museum and it included a wide variety of common industrial mechanisms like screws, cams, joints, gears, and architectural models. You can see the small um, badge of the Imperial College of Engineering on the, on the central model. Um, these types of models also included uh, a full steam engine imported from England, split in half, to literally reveal the insides to students. The carved wooden plinths and planks indicate that they were used as teaching models, a key example of the school's pedagogical commitment to the object lesson. Henry Dyer brought object lesson pedagogy with him from England and argued that it worked, quote, as a sort of leaven, which is to raise the whole body of studies, bringing the minds of the children into contact with nature in every direction, a sort of network between their thoughts and the universe around. In other words, close observation would reveal to students not only the connectedness of disciplines, but the connectedness of nature. At the same time, object lesson pedagogy was also being implemented throughout Japan at the primary level, with teachers using new textbooks that encouraged students to discover natural principles through the collective study of either images or real objects. And in these two examples of translated Japanese language textbooks, here we have teachers using images of objects instead of real objects, but we do have evidence of them using real objects. 
Um, for example, a representative lesson translated um, from an English language object uh, lesson pedagogy book into Japanese includes a lesson on water and instructs students to, quote, observe and tell how it looks as clear, transparent, also that it is cool, tasteless, colorless, and inodorous, and also tell them to observe how the water comes from the clouds as rain and observe that water will turn into vapor or steam by heat. The industrial object lesson at the college works in a similar way. Observation of these, of these machines and technical objects would be done collectively to simultaneously give students knowledge of nature while creating pragmatic knowledge of modernization's industrial instruments. For instance, the phenomena of stored mechanical energy was taught through the clock, and the properties of compression and combustion were taught through the steam engine. To know the insides of the thing meant literally witnessing its insides but more importantly, observing its obedience to natural laws and its correlation to related phenomena. W.E. Ayrton, the college's professor of natural philosophy, stressed that these object lessons, though confined to the technical museum, the lab, and the students' own experimental desks, were not supposed to end there. They were intended to encourage one to observe what exists, what is taking place in Japan itself, and in leading him to see that there are as many good examples of physical laws in the natural phenomena of his own country as can be gathered from foreign textbooks. Like imported Western machines that gathered in the college's technical museum, proving the connectedness of natural phenomena in their own country, imported styles and methods of Western architecture did the same. Outside of the rarefied halls of the college, there were very, very few students at this college when it first opened, including approximately six students of architecture, a new genre of popular illustrated science book, uh, Rika, Kyori, there are various names for science at this time, helped explain natural phenomena like lightning, uh, steam, and simple astronomy, but also teach values of empiricism to dissuade readers from believing in superstitious explanations. <laughs> And we, here we have two images from these type of uh, Curie books um, that are explaining common uh, mistakes that might be made when one is viewing natural phenomenon. Uh, the one on the left includes the problems that may be had when trying to observe the rising sun being blocked by clouds, and on the right, the phenomenon of refraction in water. Um, and it should be noted that these phenomena were, of course, known in Japan at the time. However, this is a, a genre of popular science book written in a very simplified Japanese with furigana, or this type of hyper Japanese text that will allow for easy reading, even if you don't know Chinese characters. Um, and in these books, architecture was commonly used to test one's ability of empirical prowess, um, including on the left, um, an example uh, explaining the phenomenon of uh, a mirage uh, as experienced by a traveler in Venice, uh, the uh, sight of the city suddenly materializing out of the water mist um, uh, broken up by the light. Uh, architecture was also used uh, to represent the supposed symmetry and cohesion of Western modernity. And on the right is the cover of one of the more well-known um, popular science books uh, called Tempen Chi, uh, the, con the Convulsions of Nature, uh, which includes a kind of imaginary uh, assemblage of Western architecture on its cover. Um, these books also often tried to prove natural phenomena like electricals, um, or like lightning's electri electrical conductivity. Um, and these three examples show uh, the implementation of lightning rods on uh, both cathedrals and domestic houses, and what can happen if you don't do that. Um, these books satisfied Ayrton's suggestion, though most likely without his knowing, that people seek out actual proof of natural laws in their own familiar environments, with guidance in their own language, that effectively brought the outside world inside the systematic realm of a privileged Western science. Leaving the outside world, the dangerous outside world of lightning strikes and floods and earthquakes, leaving this outside world and moving back uh, into the interior main hall of the Imperial College of Engineering, we can see that it was not only the objects crowded in the center of the space that were used to teach natural laws, but also the building itself. Architecture's propensity to channel lightning strikes, illustrate acoustic phenomena, or glitter and float like a mirage on the water, turned it into an object lesson not unlike a gear or sliced steam engine. 
that architecture could be subjected to observation in this way legitimated its placement in the college's polytechnic constellation. Furthermore, the buildings matched interior and exterior symmetry manifested what Nishi called the symmetry of truth, inherent in the connection of disciplinary knowledge, so prized by modernizers. The experience of walking from the outer campus into the main hall and a procession done by hundreds of students and foreign dignitaries alike functioned as a kind of spatial diagram, manifesting the college's pedagogical maxim that learning about the connectedness of scientific knowledge could only come from observing the insides of things. Thank you very much. Oh, yay, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon, we have just crossed that line. Um, I wanna extend a very appreciative thanks to both Laura and to Ethan for the conference, for the symposium. Um, on December, sec December 7th, 1972, as the crew of Apollo 17 left Earth's orbit for the moon, Harrison Schmidt took the first ever photograph of the entire planet. In the instant his camera shutter released, a whole new holistic paradigm was unleashed, manifest in the image of Earth as one continuous sphere within whose thin living lithosphere shell we dwell. Holistic approaches in the Earth sciences were critical for the production of Biosphere 2, otherwise known as B2. In the 1960s, James Lovelock proposed the Gaia hypothesis, and the head of the University of Hawaii's exobiology laboratory, Claire Folsom, who you see here on the right, began bottling ecological samples from aquatic environments across the globe to try to understand how they would stabilize through time. Each sample contained a complete functional suite of microbes together with water and air inside a closed laboratory flask. One of his bunch, Bunchner flasks, as you see on the screen, ultimately became a diagram and a model for Biosphere 2 and its missions. The first precursor to Biosphere 2, Bios 3, um, the first manned long duration ecological experiment was launched in Siberia in 1965. Quote, the system regenerated the atmosphere for one human in a sealed 12 cubic meter chamber connected through air ducts with an, with an 18 liter algal cultivator containing chlor, chlorella, sorry, vulgaris. The algal system, by removing carbon dioxide and producing oxygen, accounted for approximately 20% of the quantities of pure air, water, and food required by a single human. It's not surprising that the world's first ecologically based life support structure was developed within the Russian context. Given that Vladimir Verlinsky, the Russian geologist and national hero, spent his career examining relationships between inorganic matter and organic matter within the lithosphere. More of a biogeochemist than a geologist, his work demonstrated that life was inextricably linked to chemical cycling within geology. Late in life, in the wake of World War II, he postulated an early version of the Anthropocene. In order to combat uh, the potential negative implications of global war, through which he saw human influence operating at a geologic scale, he proposed the Noosphere, a deeply ethical approach to maintaining large-scale human biogeochemical influences. The intentional community, from now on referred to as the Biospherians, who would later go on to create Biosphere 2, were deeply influenced by these and others, whose work spoke to their synergistic pursuits. For nearly 20 years before beginning work on B2, they were practicing ecological restoration in diverse biomes, and you can see some of them here. Um, and they were also um, writing and performing theater productions across the globe, and you can see one of them here. And we'll, we'll circle back to this. Um, but it wasn't until they discovered ecological systems theory that they found the critical process through which they could not only describe the world, but could facilitate its redesign. It was within the Odom family that ecological systems theory developed, conceived by two brothers working in ecology whose father was a sociologist. Howard and Eugene Odom conceptualized environments as systems of energy flows, initially through ecological food webs. Thinking through the science of electrical circuitry, they developed methods to trace and quantify flows of energy and matter through environments, not just representing them as taxonomies. They saw the natural world as a dynamic system, albeit existing within a fixed set of driving parameters, which if identified correctly, determined the boundary of a system. 
And you can see this box is the system boundary here, which we'll see later will map directly onto the, the physical boundary or the skin of Biosphere 2. Once an appropriate boundary was determined, the energy matter relationships within that boundary were depicted utilizing three linked methods, a flow chart diagram, which visualized all components of the system and their linkages, a set of equations, which quantified the energy movement through time, and a graph of the equations, um, which visualized relationships of the flows between and through time. Within that boundary, a large mechanistic system could be mapped and quantified. Through this modeling method, a dynamic world of, resi of residence times and flows of energy emerges, with each element in the system represented by a different symbol based on its actions, such as producer, consumer, etc. Humans and non-humans are all representative as, represented as performative entities with agency within a closed system. Their worldview was deeply relational and eventually folded social and economic factors back into their approach. Howard, in particular, spent much of his life developing ways that systems ecology could extend into the social realm. And here we see one of his diagrams where he's, he's really trying to look at all the elements that, that relate to kind of the, the constructed environment or perhaps the, the built environment um, in relationship to the natural environment and really trying to chunk out territory for what he wants to call ecological engineering that the Biospherians were looking at. So the Biospherians leveraged the Odom system's language liberally, but successfully as a tool of conceptualization, communication, and design. And so this is one of their diagrams. For Biosphere 2, they knew the project required both biological and mechanical components working in concert. Not just the objects within Biosphere 2, but their manner of assemblage was critical to their performance. Designing a synthetic ecology required the expertise of diverse disciplines who needed a common language. Throughout the evolution of B2's ecotechnical architecture and landscape, ecological systems diagrams functioned as design predictions, as scientific depictions, as scripts, as Rosetta Stones of communication, and as signifiers of co-production. Largely ecological systems diagramming facilitated whole systems thinking and interdisciplinary design across the range of experts working for the project. Um, and here we see Biosphere and John Allen reproducing the diagram as a means of communication. And this happened a lot, I, th I think. Um, so in a way, excuse me, so in a way it's off, almost a branding um, of the project. So here's the building on the right. Um, and on the left, the, the first crew of Biospherians um, on the day of entry into the first enclosure mission. So in 1999, amidst saguaro cacti and roving bands of javelina, a hybrid construction crew of professionals and a unique group of visionaries raced against the sun's daily trajectory to assemble the tightest building envelope ever constructed. B2 emerged as a stainless steel lined concrete bathtub with a space frame topper which enclosed a 3.14 acre interior containing approximately 7 million cubic feet of air, inorganic matter, and biomass. 30 trillion times smaller than Earth, or Biosphere 1, B2's first enclosure experiment, Mission 1, commenced at 8 o'clock a.m. September 26, 1991, and terminated approximately two years later. Biospherians John Allen and Mark Nelson state, that it was designed to, quote, it was designed to operate for two years with a crew of eight healthy biospherians with the aim of supplying the entire food needed for the crew, maintaining a 200 cubed meter atmosphere with safe levels of trace gases, complete recycling of human and animal waste, the recycle of water, and a minimum leakage of air. And if it failed to do any of these things, to analyze the causes to improve the apparatus, end quote. B2 created a novel architecture, materially closed but energetically open, that simulated, that simultaneously addressed a symbolic and molecular criteria. Functioning simultaneously as a venture capital project for long duration space colonization, a large scale ecological laboratory, and a social ecological experiment, in the end, only two missions occurred out of the 50 conceived. During its enclosure missions, B2 operated as the tightest material boundary condition ever constructed at architectural scale. Due to time constraints, I'll refrain from detailing its remarkable skin, but instead just note that when sealed, it facilitated energetic and information exchange from the sun and digital communications, while exchanging less than 10% of its atmosphere with Earth annually, compared to the space shuttle, which exchanged 10% of its atmosphere with outer space daily. It created a microcosm of Earth, 
an energetically open but materially closed system that produced an evolving biogeochemistry that increasingly diverged from Earth's as the experiment progressed. Its interior can be thought of as a molecular, molecular economy composed of select components of our planet's matter in liquid and gas phases that produced accelerated biogeochemical cycling. Biospherian Abigail Alien stated that it's small enough that things happen fast, but it's so small that you could see immediate changes. Containing seven synthetic biomes, a rainforest, an ocean, rainforest up here, ocean here, savanna, desert, um, an intensive agriculture zone, and then a human habitat, which is kind of back here. Um, the biomes were designed to simultaneously operate as functional ecologies and as aesthetically idealized natural landscapes. A bricolage synthesized for multiple performances, it was simultaneously a diagram, a model, a laboratory, an experiment without a control, a life support system, a dwelling, and an instrument of measure. In short, a confusing object which produced novel realities of scale, duration, and risk. And so this is um, Eugene Odom's diagram where he's trying to understand kind of different conditions of the natural world and, and measurement and possibilities kind of through isolation of a system. And biosphere is essentially this with kind of this put inside of it. <laughs> As David Baird states, instruments themselves, biosphere being one of them, um, are a kind of scientific knowledge. We are strongly wedded to connections between the concepts of knowledge, truth, and justification. Nonetheless, instruments are simultaneously resistant to these rationalizations as biosphere proved itself. For, biosphere, for the biospherians, B2 was not just an ecotechnical experiment, but a deeply cultural one, a human experiment, testing the plausibility of long duration outer space colonization. The synthetic and applied mode of experimentation existed in tension with contemporaneous cultures of empirical production of scientific knowledge, which proved highly problematic at the time. But it was not totally incongruent with other scientific practices, um, particularly Vernadsky's notion of noosphere. Utilizing Vernadsky and furthering Howard Odom's social project through ecological systems diagramming, the biospherians produced their own notion of an environmental ethic, a culture designed to support its actualization. And this is one of their diagrams. It's doing that work. The closest thing to a manifesto the biospherians produced was published in 1989, two years before Mission One commenced. Within the text, they describe their mission in terms of the creation of a transformative culture where homo sapiens become creative collaborators with ecological earth systems and ultimately create living art forms that champion life and space exploration. They cast themselves as heroes in a new age. But once locked inside, the realities of the conceptual hitting the innate intelligent agency of the material, particularly in the form of ecotechnical hybrids, was daunting. This required integration of processes of instruments and experimental design, demanded new mappings of flows and devices for data collection and processing, novel hybrid ecotechnical programs and infrastructures, and a unique culture of sustainable stewardship. Imagined driving forces and once invisible energy began to appear, often in the forms of air and water quality and quantity. The material world began to act as inscription devices in, of itself that reified theories and practices, revealing performance in the system. Of course, the biospherians inside were deeply familiar with ecological systems diagrams. They had helped create them and how those diagrams facilitated the measurement of environment according to productivity and how their human bodies were being measured according to health and toxicity. These large scale diagrams located within biosphere and archival materials, I, I have yet to be able to confirm that they were actually made in one of the biospherians workshops, but, um, but I suspect they are or were. Um, not only evidence concerns surrounding air quality, but suggests that biospherians were utilizing ecological systems theory approaches in very informal ways, um, and certainly with less expertise than it was originally designed. All of these approaches contribute to a relatively seamless materialization of the Odom's ecological systems theory into systems engineering, specifying not only flows of matter and energy, but facilitating the specification of material, of mechanical equipment that could produce inscriptions of these flows and feed them back into biosphere's interior condition, which ultimately produced procedures, pathways, and protocols. In this case, depicted as a cybernetic systems engineering diagram, 
which could simultaneously be read as a script for the performance of synthetic machine-human environment interactions. Here, the appearance of human stick figure forms, both as sensors and actuators. Whoa, sorry. Come back. Um, and you can see them here and here. Um, precariously positioned biospherian bodies within the system. Concern over maintaining specific atmospheric parameters, particularly oxygen, was of primary importance. The residence time of atmospheric carbon within Biosphere 2 was one to four days and unstable, compared to that of Earth, which was about three years. The Biospherians needed to be nimble in order to regulate these fluctuations. Their extensive theater experience allowed them to see their roles within the diagram as a script. Their agency was largely scripted, but within that predetermined role, they could interpret and improvise within their glazed theater in the round. And again, these are um, more images of, of their theater work from um, the 70s and 80s around the world. They acted as gods when determining the change of seasons. With the push of a rain button, they accomplished their will. They played the roles of ecologists, naturalists, gardeners, explorers, prisoners, guinea pigs, survivors, and in this case, laborers, harvesting and drying savanna biomass several times a year in order to sequester carbon. They had to tread between idealized conceptual mappings of ecological systems and energy matter flows, the realities of material frictions, and between the cognitively dissonant modes of operation as post-humans and transhumans which had significant ethical and procedural implications that caught all of B2 species within a cybernetic web of co-production and unnatural sites of agency. They managed all of this as calories became increasingly scarce and oxygen levels mysteriously plummeted. Their bodies took on the role of inscription devices as sleep apnea and hunger kicked in. Though uncomfortable, they were making new knowledge about the natural world through embodied material experience. Many of their bodily inscriptions were not hidden, but taken as experimental data. Not dissimilar to many contemporary art practices, their bodies became sites of not just scientific, but also artistic production, so much so that it fostered several collaborations between those inside and outside in Biosphere One. Lines between daily living, scientific experiment, and artistic production began to blur. Here a beta-carotene diet inscribes palms orange, and those same altered hands, evidence of living within an alternate environment, created new cultural norms, such as the Biospherian handshake, clearly a product of interiority, of extreme interiority. As Donna Haraway states, the relation is the smallest unit of analysis, and the relation is about, is about significant otherness at every scale. That is the ethic, or perhaps better, mode of attention with which we must approach the long cohabitings of people and other species. The interior condition of Biosphere 2 created an intimacy between the Biospherians and the others they cohabitated with, facilitated not only their entanglement as understood through ecological systems diagrams, but also through tacit knowledge and embodied experience. In time, the room of Biosphere 2 became endearingly referred to as the ninth Biospherian. In the words of Mission 1 Biospherian Abigail Ailing, quote, we could traverse the closed system, touch the space frame and cement floor, remember how the biomes were created, and visualize the entire world we lived and breathed for two years. This provided powerful insights about Biosphere 2 that would not have been fully possible if we did not have the opportunity to participate in its design and construction. Because of this, we were there to learn about the system we had created and let the complex nature of this coherent closed system teach us about its dynamic cycles, and in what ways our daily actions impacted this miniature world. In time, we learned how to live with this evolving system and become stewards of its well-being. This experience brought a shift of consciousness. We became part of this unique man-made biosphere. Our health and well-being was synonymous with the health of Biosphere 2. It was an unprecedented two-year experiment between the observer and the observed due to the length and comprehensive design of the experiment. The observer was part of the experiment, the cooperative manager, observing it as part of a process." End quote. Meanwhile, scientists outside were not sharing the Biospherian's euphoric experience of entanglement. They vehemently debated methods and results, struggling to carve out zones of objectivity within the, tank, within the entangled experiment. Ultimately, their failure, initial power structures, or internal power structures, and the discrediting of the project by the popular press left the experiment's results uninterpreted and the eco-architectural body of B2 cracked open to exchange matter with B1. 
B2's entire premise and experiment was contingent on interiority in the form of the tightest envelope ever constructed. Despite its almost impenetrable skin, B2 was incredibly leaky energetically and informationally, and ultimately totally reliant on B1. It required Earth's organic and inorganic matter to initially synthesize itself, but in the end, it proved largely sterile. During the enclosure missions, Biosphere 2 was a model, even a mirror of Earth, that slowly diverged, a Klein bottle of sorts that played out entanglements between the conceptual and the material in ways that rendered them more visible. Physicist Richard Feynman is famous for saying, what I cannot create, I do not understand. Biosphere 2's interiority facilitated new understandings that produced novel creation. I leave you with a painting from a series created by Marie Harding, the former CFO of Space Biosphere's Ventures. The work de depicts a world within Biosphere 2 where the relentless geometry of the space frame enclosure facilitates an intensely vibrant and present material world teeming with life. The interior of Biosphere 2 created an alternate biospheric system, one that attempted to model another possible worldview of Earth's biosphere, the feasibility of lunar and Martian space stations, and potentially other interior worlds beyond. Thank you. Thank you all for those terrific papers. Um, I will be brief because I'm sure that you all have many questions. Um, but I wanted to start out by asking um, about one connection among your papers that occurred to me, uh, which was that each of these papers studies not only the knowledge and objects, in some cases, that were produced within the room or the space that you chose, but also how these ideas and things were translated to audiences outside of these rooms. Um, and so very much well, inspired by all three papers, um, I wanted to ask you a very big question about how you define the space or the room that you have chosen to study and present here, and how you define its boundaries. Um, I mean, thinking very much about the paper we just heard. Um, and then how does the concept of either a specific room or a room within a series of parts um, what type of work does that do in your larger projects relating to these papers? I can start, yeah. <laughs> um, so clearly, the, the systems diagram generated the, the glass enclosure for Biosphere 2, which was critical for photosynthesis. Um, I didn't take time to speak about two additional objects which are attached to Biosphere, which are called lungs which actually regulate um, volume of air within the building. Um, basically, the, the air can heat up so much that it would explode the building from inside. So they needed kind of a separate air regulation system. There was redundancy in everything with Biosphere 2, so there were two of them. Um, <laughs> so already, you can see that the, the boundary starts to, to get complicated, right? We, even though, you know, um, so it, and then there are a few other conditions. Um, I'm working on a paper right now about what the Biospherians termed volunteers in the system, but, mm -hmm. but you know, they, they collected species from different biomes all around the world. They brought them to Arizona. They were quarantined for a period of time, kind of cleaned up. You know, they had a very specific species list of what went in, um, but the building was under construction and open for a certain amount of time. Um, you know, they had to crane in some species before they could do full enclosure and then release the rest. And, and so there were these other species that ended up inside. You know, and, and so again, questions about, you know, if everything is budgeted and diagrammed and measured, but then you've got these unknown variables, what, what does that mean or what does that do to conceptually an idea about a closed system experiment and also um, when you think about agency, like, what does that mean? What, 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 what are these creatures' roles in this, in this system, and, and, and are they benefiting or not? And, and in certain cases, a lot of them did quite well within the system. So I don't know if that answers your question exactly, but. <laughs> thank you. Oh, uh, thank you very much for the question. Uh, it's super interesting. I mean, of course, there's 
say, a limited architectural boundary of the school that I was um, looking at. However, I'm going to focus in on your use of the term translation, because I think that's a very important component of um, what I presented today. Um, and the difficulties of translation of certain um, values of interiority, let's say, that uh, for the experiments that were happening inside of this cloistered uh, laboratory space in Tokyo, which I did mention this, but was very much lauded by international commentators at the time. Architecturally, the lab had a super thick foundation with um, stabilizing piers for all the instruments to ensure um, epistemological values of precision, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and people who came from Europe said this is the finest laboratory. It even uh, uh, outperforms those in European schools. Um, however, uh, what then connects the knowledge or the objects that are studied in that laboratory with those that are studied outside of the school, say with natural phenomenon, et cetera? Um, it would be my contention that it's a shared mode of observation. However, for a school that is operating primarily in English, you have one word, and they used observation all the time. However, the word observation in Japanese was in no way uh, solidified at this moment. Um, in fact, the, the author and speaker that I mentioned in my talk, Nishi Amane, was responsible for translating some of these words, and he often gave multiple translations. So the three kind of um, epistemological verbs that he focuses on are observation, experience, and experiment, and he often interchanges them uh, throughout his text. So they're in no way really solid, and they switch off in, in those um, scientific manuals that I showed as well. So there, there are some slippages of knowing an interior through the kind of translations and mistranslations of what it means to know interiors, I think. Uh, very briefly, I would say that uh, I was extremely surprised when airplanes emerged as... Uh, <laughs> as was I reading your paper in a wonderful way. <laughs> as a leading concern in this conversation, which seemed to be thoroughly about photography and um, about artifacts extracted from this particular architectural space and whether or not they had been made through a darkened camera obscura of one type or another. Uh, and then when the combustion chamber emerged, I was shocked, <laughs> which is the product of archival digging and following a strand, which at first seemed incidental, but then became in increasingly insistent. So I say that. OK, may I open it up to you? Uh, yes. Um, I'm interested in, particularly in, with the lab in Japan and Biosphere 2, is that they're, um, think they're environments that are specifically for people within them to work, but are also presented to the outside world. And in Biosphere 2, there are literally actors inside, which makes it, to me, uh, as a, a performance also for outside. Can you speak to some of the notions of performance and these spaces being stages to be observed by audiences? If you'd like to go for it. Um, yes, d depending on when um, you spoke to biospherians and who, they would speak more or less about that aspect of the project, certainly. Um, that said, it was hugely considered in, in terms of marketing and positioning in relationship to um, I think to, to sort of the space race um, or kind of the tail end of the, the space race um, and sort of a more socio-technical aspect. You know, there's a, there also, the, the Biospherians were kind of also this really, you know, alternative um, intentional community. So there's kind of a bit of a like back to the lab versus back to the land dichotomy that's happening that, that they're, you know, downplaying one side to try to play up another side, and, and there's a whole way that, that those identities are being constructed in the project. Um, another really interesting thing about the project is that it's all glass, almost. It, you know, probably, I, I, I really need to do this calculation, but it's probably at least 85% glass. 
And so, and there were some locations within the biomes where, um, that were private. Um, within the rainforest, there's a, a constructed kind of mountain and there's a tiger pond is up there and there was definitely like some skinny dipping that was happening in tiger <laughs> pond and you know, different kinds of activities. But, um, but by and large, they were on display and through most of mission one, the site was open to the public. Um, you know, there's, there's images of like, you know, kids licking ice cream cones, looking in, and the biosphereans are like starving inside, you know, and stuff like this. So, so it, it was a very public um, kind of project, but simultaneously very private. And, and that's, I think, what caused some of the issues with the press, is the press got wind of, of they weren't getting a whole story about some things and just ran with it. Yeah, and in uh, respect to the school, I mean, it could be said that the school at once was a place for education of students, but also for the kind of curated display of the students and their work. Um, the school, uh, prior to maybe the late 1870s, early 1880s, was uh, sort of on the tour map for visiting dignitaries. So say if you were coming from England and you were interested in uh, either investing in railroads or building lighthouses, et cetera, the, the um, Ministry of Public Affairs would take you, oh, look at this school. We are producing the best um, uh, engineers, et cetera, et cetera. And as you will see, they're wearing uh, Western uniforms. Uh, they're speaking English. Um, here we can go visit their labs and we can see their experiments. So I think, um, I think you're very much correct in emphasizing this performative um, element. And in fact, that main hall that I focused on would be the kind of congregation hall for these foreign dignitaries. And so these books and teaching objects become a kind of performative display of um, the school's kind of successful transplant of, of these Western ideas. Uh, yes, Ethan. Yeah, so uh, sun pictures, amazing, amazing story. Uh, maybe I, I, I didn't catch this, but the image you showed us looked like an old master painting or a reproduction of a, yeah. of a painting. And I'm curious about that and whether um, art history figures into your story and the kind of 19th century accounting of um, works from the past, collecting. Uh, are there glimmers of like the mechanical in sure. the way they're writing about <laughs> art? And why is it, why is the only sun picture we have like an image of a painting, not nature? Well, yeah. it, almost all of them are. Um, the m sort of largest, most conspicuous one is a Benjamin West. It's after a Benjamin West. It's uh, a Stratonike and Antiochus. It's set as a history painting subject both in the French and British academies in 1774-75. That subject is what finally wins David the Rome Prize, incidentally. And the next year, it's set as uh, a history prize subject uh, in the British Academy. So part of the longer story is about the way in which West, following, as I see it, Reynolds, has embraced highly unstable recherche pigments and chemical materials into his factor, which necessitates the replication by chemomechanical means of the grand manner uh, academic paintings in the first place. That's the rationale. I mean, there's the broader rationale shared across Europe that oil is a highly fragile, fugitive medium, which is all going to be lost, which replicates the academic replication is intended to offset in part. Well, some of these are uh, polychrome sun pictures. But there are other, this is competing in an entrepreneurial marketplace for a whole bunch of different chemomechanical strategies, which is how they're described in the period. There's one called polyplasiasmos, for example, which is practiced by a guy named Joseph Booth, who uh, has uh, an institution on Pall Mall. It starts off, I think, in Golden Square, then moves you know, up in the world to Pall Mall uh, in the 1780s. His, he is producing artifacts, and there's some examples of this in the British Museum, for example, which look like oil pictures on canvas. 
but they have the pictorial quality of wallpaper. And it seems that what he is doing is he is preparing a thick ground, a highly absorptive, chemically absorptive ground for the reception of what are effectively stenciled or stamped oil cut blocks. Something like this. It, um, Anthony Griffith, who was previously at the British Museum and I think now attached to the Getty, has done the most detailed technical study of this. And the idea seems to have been that they, he thickened a ground with an unusually large amount of pumice mixed into the gesso priming layer, which would then help to absorb the oil paint and make it touch dry quickly so you could superimpose these different sort of matrices of oil cut stamped form that could then be lifted off. So he says in his bombastic treatises on this, and there are several of these that survive, but there are also catalogs of what they're reproducing. And they're selling Reynolds, West, Angelica Kaufman. So like top flight contemporaneous academicians are their bread and butter. There are a few exceptions like they have a few uh, Rubens, Veronese, Claude Lorraine, so on and so forth. But British painters of the top academic tier or their uh, aspiring underlings are the central organizing concern. And they're selling these things for pennies on the pound against the originals. And it's all about you know, the great social benefits that will flow into Britain if everyone has a Reynolds not in uh, not through the mediation of the contrivances of Mr. Engraver, who is <laughs> just a mechanist. They will have the real experience of color. And so the chromatic infusion, which is, of course, also the great instability of Reynoldsian painting, because Reynolds is then cast as a great colorist, but because of his chemical experiments, it's deeply fugitive. And the surfaces are going to crack, and this is all going to be lost. So what is being chemically uh, it's sort of a fighting fire with fire, or fighting chemical fire with fire is the metaphor to which I've come to think of this, where chemical, chemically unstable preparations have been introduced both at a practical and discursive level by Reynolds uh, into the manufacture, the creation, the construction of art in the grand manner. But the instability that is also built into that project is then counteracted by the industrially produced chemical replicas, which then get rediscovered in the 1860s and called photographs. So the fact that it's replicas totally matters, that it's these particular, this particular cast of characters who are being replicated totally matters, I think. So I very much encourage all audience members to find our panelists to ask them more questions. I've been giving the signal, though, that we are it's lunchtime. <laughs> so have a good lunch. Be back here at 2, no later, 2. And please join me in giving our panelists a round of applause to thank them for their great papers. So welcome back um, to our symposium. Um, we, um, we are back to follow on, on our conversations. So just to briefly introduce myself, my name is Lola Sanchez, and I was uh, another Meyer Curatorial Fellow, the first one, the oldest one. And I was here working with Ethan in the Philosophy Chamber in the research and the planning of the exhibition from 2014 to 2016. And I am currently working at the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow University, where we will host the um, Philosophy Chamber show in March next year, and we can wait for that. <coughs> so now, without further ado, we will move on to our last panel of the day, virtual rooms. And for this panel, we have an exceptional selection of papers that will focus on a range of strategies, visualizing, recreating, and simulating to transform the space of the room into a different reality. So we will have Nicholas Robbins, PhD student at the Department of History of Art at the Yale University, who will talk about Paul Nelson's surgical theater at the Cité Hospitalière de Lille. We have also Sarah Ann Carter, curator and director of research at the Chipstone Foundation, who will invite us to visit Mrs. M's cabinet and reflect on period room as pedagogy. 
And finally, we'll have Chad Randall, visiting lecturer in architecture at University of Oregon, who will fly us to the sky uh, <laughs> with his bedroom aviator, flight simulations, and domestic realm. Please welcome our first speaker. Thank you so much, Lola. And thank you um, to everyone who's contributed um, to today's uh, wonderful conversation, um, and to Laura and Ethan for inviting me. Okay. Two years before the architect Paul Nelson was born in Chicago, Thomas Aikens exhibited his paintings, The Gross Clinic and The Agnew Clinic, at that city's 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Aikens' paintings celebrated surgery's ascendance within both medical and popular culture as a paradigmatically modern, rational practice, rather than a barbarous measure of last resort. <clears throat> Apprehended upon their exhibition, not as a celebration of medical prowess, but instead as, quote, ghastly symphonies in gore and bitumen, their intended significance <coughs> shifted dramatically when encountered outside the spaces of the medical profession. Perhaps this was due, <coughs> in part, to their unsettling insistence on the presence of bodies, on their fleshiness and capacity for touch, sensation, and pain. The perspectival systems of both works collapses the distance between surgery and spectator. The wall of intently watching faces seated in the banked surgical amphitheater forms an unsettlingly proximate corporeal backdrop to the instructive scene. Compare Aikens's Agnew Clinic, then, with illustrations of a surgical theater published 40 years later in the fall 1933 issue of the journal L'Architecture Vivante. At right, we see two surgeons in the center, swathed in white, glowing under the intense, mirror-enhanced artificial light emanating from above, and leaning over a body barely visible under yet more blanched fabric. They seem not to touch, but rather to look, as do the two female aides standing slightly back. The room is otherwise empty. Um, the illustration at left, two male faces press up close to a surface, a screen upon which the image of the surgery is being projected in an adjacent room. The tangled tissues of the surgical site are shown glowing, weightless, and detached from the body to which they belong, akin to a page in an anatomical textbook. L'Architecture Vivant ascribed authorship of these illustrations not to an architect, but to the surgeon Oscar Lambre, professor of clinical surgery at Lille. But they formed part of a longer collaboration in the early 1930s between Paul Nelson, doctors and scientists, to propose a new model for medical architecture, the Cité Hospitalière de Lille. This was Nelson's most ambitious project to date, and followed upon his early interests in medicine while a student at the École des Beaux-Arts and in the atelier of Auguste Perret. And I should note, due to the um, uh, aerial nature of the airplane, uh, that he was actually a fighter pilot uh, in World War I, and that's how he ended up in France. The massive complex at Lille was never built, but the plans were published in a large volume by Cahiers d'Art in 1933, a book which stands autonomously as a manifesto for what Nelson called a new, quote, technological architecture, of which its surgical chamber was exemplary. Nelson's plans published in this volume provide an opportunity to consider the ways in which surgery reconfigured conceptions of architectural space and its relationship to technology, vision, and the human body. In his designs for Lille's operating theater, we move from the corporeal space of the amphitheater to a surgical theater for the age of cinema, a world of images and fragments defined like surgery by the action of the cut. Architectural space is reconceived to produce the hyper-visibility of the surgical site, now excised and projected from the body. Since Foucault's The Birth of the Clinic, vision and the convergence of seeing and knowing have been central to critical histories of medical practice, with the hospital as a key intersection of architecture and biopolitics. Nelson's design represents a shift in which architecture itself has usurped the agency of the surgeon, delivering up the body of the patient not for physical but for visual inspection, 
and performing the operations of fragmentation and individuation central to what was called the medical gaze. Nelson's, Nelson's design follows on a longer tradition of medical architecture's central role in defining the environmental agency of architectural space. In the 19th century, the development of pavilion plan hospitals, a, a version of which you can see on the left, and other new models of spatial organization promoted the delivery of fresh air and light to patients. Such models of architecture, based on miasmatic theories of disease, did not end after the contested acceptance of germ theory and the introduction of antiseptic chemicals to surgical practice. Indeed, the hygienic concerns of medical reform in the 19th century, light, air, cleanliness, became central to the ideologies of much of modern architecture in the 20th. As Beatrice Colomina writes, quote, modern architecture was unproblematically understood as a kind of medical equipment, a mechanism for protecting and enhancing the body. Buildings such as hospitals and tuberculosis sanatoria, you can see Alvar Alto's Paimeo sanatorium on the right, became models for designing domestic space, with the house reformulated as a machine for living along the lines of the machine for healing that was the hospital. Surgery, with its emphasis on antiseptic purity and minute precision, represented a limit case of medical practices relationship to architectural space. A writer for Architects Journal in 1925 claimed that, quote, the modern hospital is a triumph of the elimination of the detrimental and the unessential. Because of its absolute fitness to purpose, its operation theater, like the engine room of an ocean liner, is one of the most perfect rooms in the world. Nelson, in collaboration with Lambre, set out to design just such a perfect room <coughs> at Lille. In his project for the Cité Hospitalière, the model for which we can see here in a photograph taken by Man Ray and published in the book, Nelson was tasked with unifying all the functions of medical treatment at Lille and the surrounding region into one quasi-metropolis, one, quote, organism, as Nelson refers to it in his introduction to the volume. The medical center, which combined hospital and medical school in one, was at its center, and that's the building on the right, the, the skyscraper. The key challenge of integrating all of these functions, as Christian Zervos writes in the introduction to the volume, was the need to, quote, ensure the isolation of the patients, controlling the passage of the students through space, and preserving the character of autonomy, unquote, of each medical practice a means of orchestrating the mobility of bodies and disciplines through clinical space. Nelson placed great weight upon the hybrid section and diagram of the medical center that is reproduced at the beginning of the book, which provides an overview of the relationships and adjacencies of the center's many functions. The plan of the building in diagrammatic form comes to represent the totality of medical practice and suggests that the building itself, by sheer force of its program, carries out the center's functions of healing, knowledge production, and training. In the almost dizzyingly detailed array of plans that follow, there are a few cases in which sections of his design are pulled out for axonometric representation. The operating suite was one such case seen in this colored and annotated rendering. Here, we find a hospital devoid of the human body, either that of the surgeon or the patient. Instead of the gore and bitumen of Aikens' canvases, Nelson presents a linear vision of diagrammatic mechanical space, replete with positions in which the human body can be inserted, centered on the surgical beds highlighted in white. The two surgical rooms are surrounded by a sequence of spaces that support the building's production of antiseptic and anesthetic conditions. A sterilization chamber, a wash-up room, and out of sight, a, quote, central gas room that pipes the anesthetics into the room. Situated between the surgical rooms is a cinematic classroom with five rows of swiveling red cushion chairs called the, quote, episcopic room borrowing a term from microscopy to denote an image produced by reflected light. On either side of the room, two screens receive a projected image from the apparatus 
that hangs above the beds in the adjacent rooms, which serve both as a source of illumination and as a projector of the image of the body below. A loudspeaker amplifies the surgeon's instructions and comments. Nelson's use of axonometric perspective places his work in dialogue with figures in the interwar avant-garde, such as Theo von Doesberg and El Lazitsky, whose use of axonometry a decade earlier was intended to challenge the fixed anthropomorphic space of linear perspective, the domain of Aiken's paintings, and replace it with a reversible projection extending from either side of the image surface. Nelson's axonometric representation of his surgical theater emphasizes this spatial virtuality, presenting the episcopic room as a space in which projection decorporealizes both the body of the surgical subject and the body of the student spectator. The presentation of the surgical act as a screen image serves an ev evident medical purpose, maintaining the building's total antisepsis by eliminating the students from the surgical room. Indeed, the patients and the students enter the space from entirely isolated corridors. This spatial isolation separates while conflating two discrete acts of looking, that of the surgeon and that of the student. The projector provides the student with a surgeon's eye view of the procedure, but one that has been converted into an image, flat and mobile and disarticulated from the totality of the patient's body. Nelson had a background in cinema, having designed a set for the Gloria Swanson vehicle, What a Widow, as well as a private <laughs> cinema for Joseph Kennedy in 1930, which was never built. The cinematic remediation of the body in this case happens in real time. The projection and screen convert the ongoing material reality of the surgical procedure into visual information. Here, architectural agency permits the medical gaze, as Foucault describes it, to quote, <clears throat> circulate within an enclosed space in which it is controlled only by itself. Nelson's surgical theater almost diagrams this disciplining and distributing of vision, converting the terms of clinical perception into the structure of arch architectural space. This layer of virtual remediation distinguishes Nelson's design from other contemporary reconsiderations of the surgical theater. On the right, we see the observation room of an operating theater at James Gamble Rogers New York Medical Center, a project that had been a model for Nelson's Cité Hospitalière, in which students are seated above the surgical table, their vision trained through magnifying lenses upon the operation below the skylight, disciplined and distant to be certain, yet retaining a sense of corporeal access to the space of operation. The projection and production of knowledge below the episcopic room is supported procedurally and physically by the presence of a small laboratory below, the second room joining both <coughs> surgical chambers. And he's actually sort of operated upon the image so that um, you can see below here the laboratory. Um, here, samples collected from the surgical body can be examined under the microscope directly upon their removal from the patient's body. The results of this examination, we are told, can be immediately projected upstairs for the benefit of the students. In this reconfiguration of medical space, Nelson's design constructs a circuit between surgical, laboratory, and pedagogical spaces, isolating them while initiating a frictionless visual and material communication between each space and affecting the passage of the subject from body to tissue sample to image. The production of knowledge was central to Nelson's con conception of the future of medicine. In an address he gave to the Paris International Congress on Hygiene in 1933, the same year his plans for Lille were published, he described a vision for the system of medical centers for France, administered by the state, whose central filing system could retain copies of tests and procedures undergone at each site, a quote, living medical record and source of information for scholars and statisticians, as well as references for the needs of public, military, and judicial services. As the accompanying diagram from his lecture, which is up there, shows, this system was designed to segregate but capture both healthy and sick bodies, a total national register of medicine that produces subjects visible not only to science, but also to the state at large. 
The Surgical Theatre at Lille was imagined as just one of the many sites in which this registration and conversion of bodies into knowledge could occur. In the space of Nelson's Surgical Theatre, this conversion does not lack a material register. Despite the putative transformation of the body into episcopic light, the tissues of the body partake instead of the materiality of the room itself, projected through and upon its substance, as seen here in the illustration, where the student's proximity to the screen wall suggests that they wish to touch this image, turned inside out in order to merge with the surface. Here we remember the name of the journal in which this illustration was published, L'Architecture Vivante, Living Architecture. Following the non-realization of his ambitious plans at Lille, Nelson continued to pursue the perfection of medical and surgical space with an architectural vocabulary in which space itself takes on an organic and biological being. In his designs for a hospital at Saint-Lô in Normandy, completed in 1956, he realized many of his plans for the Cité Hospitalière, but radically rethought the form of surgical space, this time not as a room for teaching, but as a self-contained entity. The walls of the ovoid surgical room are inset with an array of lights that could be individually controlled to produce the perfect lighting conditions. The surgical chamber here takes on the qualities of an ideal organ, visible at all points, bounded by smooth, curved, antiseptic surfaces, served by a sophisticated climate control system maintaining temperature and circulation of air. It is a vision in which the medical body has been replaced by the body of architecture, organic, self-perpetuating, and purifying, and perfectly visible to itself. Thank you. Um, before I begin, I want to thank my co-panelists, Ethan, Laura, and of course Heather for um, wonderful organizing this weekend. I'm, um, I'm so happy to be here, and it's been so wonderful to learn um, from all of you. Mrs. M's cabinet, and can everyone hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> Mrs. Um's Cabinet is an exhibition, teaching, and research project created by the Chipstone Foundation uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the Milwaukee Art Museum. Chipstone is a private foundation, shown here, based in Wisconsin, devoted to the study of decorative arts, material culture, and innovative museum practice. And we've partnered with the Milwaukee Art Museum to create more than 40 exhibitions since 1999. Mrs. M's Cabinet emerged as a curatorial strategy so one of these exhibitions with a series of goals. First, we wanted to present Chipstone's world-class collection of 17th century ceramics to the general public in a new and engaging way. Next, we wanted to rethink the history of museum display strategies, particularly the period room. And finally, to consider the place of narrative, curatorial authority, which I feel like we're always trying to give up and which we struggle with in various ways, and collaboration in the modern museum gallery. The cabinet, shown here, engages with the tropes of the historic period room, with the goal of offering new possibilities for authorship, interpretation, and participation in the museum. To do this, we created the character of Mrs. M, a late 19th century collector with a rich inner life and a clear point of view about the past. Our team then projected this interiority through the design of her gallery, her cabinet. Mrs. M is a composite character based on interdisciplinary research. She is, in a sense, a set of ideas, an intellectual vehicle through which participants may explore the historic possibilities of period rooms and the ways museums make meaning out of objects more broadly. The expansiveness of Mrs. M's character has allowed for varied modes of interpretation, inviting collaboration. In my graduate seminar, Curating Mrs. M's World, my students investigated her story, her organizing principles, what may be termed the category of Mrs. M, to create new installations for seven historic objects, which I chose from our collection. My students thought not only about the art historical arguments they hoped to make, but how they could make a meaningful argument through Mrs. M's worldview and space. My brief talk today offers the ongoing Mrs. M's cabinet project as a case study for investigating the interpretive and scholarly possibilities 
opened up by viewing a period room, not as a static space depicting just one moment, but as a set of intellectual problems and pedagogical possibilities. So, who is Mrs. M? Mrs. M's cabinet is centered on the story of an imagined female collector who amassed a remarkable group of international 17th century ceramics that may be traced archeologically to early America. This narrative reflects the archeological research of the Jamestown Rediscovery Project, a project which has really inspired Chipstone's collection over the past several years, which has allowed us to expand our collecting interests from collecting objects that have, uh, were made in England or America to collecting a much broader range of objects that have an archeological um, precedent in early America. So we can collect objects that are from various European countries, from Asia, from North Africa, et cetera, because they were, have evidence of being used in North America. And Mrs. M shares these collecting interests. As her story develops, visitors learn that she is a scholar, a collector of great taste, and a bit of a mystery. She passes between cultures and places, gathering objects, and building a collection in her fine home. In her biography, which spans a childhood spent mudlarking for ceramic fragments along the James River in Virginia to studying history and confronting what she felt was a rather limited and narrow vision of American history presented at the Centennial Exhibition, shaped her intellectual world and helped her understand the cosmopolitan nature of material life in early America. She presents her collection of worldly 17th century things in an interior that represents the best cosmopolitan styles of the late 19th century as well. So 17th century cosmopolitan things in a late 19th century cosmopolitan interior. The space, designed by Brent Budsberg excuse me, and Shana McCaw, um, two artists and designers with whom we work, uh, through their work, her cabinet is as beautiful and full of wonder as it is intellectually dense. Mrs. M, for example, hangs Ojibwe snowshoes which I should say here at Harvard is a nod to two snowshoes hanging on the wall of the Artemis Ward House, a Harvard museum. She hangs these on the wall across from a painting of the Hongs of Canton, not too far away from a lustrous hispano Moorish porringer. These very international cosmopolitan objects. She presents a view of 17th century America from her world in the late 19th century that challenges visitors to consider how history is narrated in the 21st century in our museums. And in a way, this approach allows Mrs. M to short circuit historical expectations grounded in the American colonial revival, period of late 19th century museum building that still impacts the ways a lot of our institutions look and opens up new historical possibilities. So what kinds of interpretations does her cabinet make possible? Well, Still somewhat controversially, in Mrs. M's cabinet, we have avoided all traditional museum labels. Anything that suggests a 21st century museum has been excised. Mrs. M is introduced to her visitors in a miniature scale Pepper's Ghost illusion, a space with a video projected inside of a paper doll house, not unlike this maquette from Harvard's collections. So you'd come in, pull this golden cord, and in this film, she offers a synopsis of her biography and also directly questions visitors to reflect on the presentation of US history in museums. She asks, you know, what is America? Where is America? Who is America? Is it a place? Is it an idea? Is it a set of beliefs that unites people from different backgrounds? So she's asking these questions directly as Mrs. M inside of this um, Pepper's ghost illusion projected in her cabinet. And for more than a century, those of us who study period rooms know, most creators of period rooms have really sidestepped these kinds of deeper interpretive questions about what the meanings of these spaces are, preferring to focus on a particular style, a particular moment, a particular place as the real meaning of period rooms. And period rooms that do that often have the power to present seamless, seductive visions of the past. Seamless and seductive because they present plausible, domestically scared spaces, scaled spaces that you imagine you can just walk into, be part of, that often un uncritically present a very particular vision of the past. 
And in effect, these historic interiors may present compelling fictions about the past that really quite uncritically reflect outdated visions of exclusive historical narratives. Well, Mrs. M chooses to place her cabinet very much in contrast to these sorts of outdated historical narratives, explicitly bringing up the 1876 Centennial Exhibition, explicitly referencing things like the New England Kitchen to challenge these fictionalized visions of early American history, visions that only seem to acknowledge very limited cultural influences on early America, limitations she wishes to challenge through her collecting, through the evidence that we, as scholars, knows there in the objects that were historically present in early America. So through her Prepper's Ghost Interactive, she's actively positioning herself as the curator of her cabinet, the curator of her cabinet that makes an argument about the past and its relationship to the present. Each aspect of Mrs. M's cabinet conveys a deliberate aesthetic and historic choice that makes her story possible. It is not simply to design an historic interior but to develop a character in a way that takes seriously this late 19th century notion that interiors, this notion of interiority, that your interior actually is reflecting the person who created it. And this is something that many scholars um, have written about and thought a lot about. To further this effect, we decided to select the sophisticated and quite cosmopolitan McKim, Mead, and White designed Isaac Bell House in Newport, Rhode Island, which dates to the early 1880s as a model for her cabinet, taking some of the details from this house as a way to create a late 19th century cosmopolitan home for her 17th century cosmopolitan things. The overall cabinet design really mirrors this cosmopolitan nature of her collecting interests. And without barriers to entry, the space is one that is to be used. You know, we invite you to have a seat in her Cromwellian chair. It's a reproduction in this case. Um, and, you know, the lighting, Everything in this space is one that is inviting you in to sit down, to read some of her books, to explore the space. And there are no hints of a larger 21st century infrastructure. And those of you who work in museums will appreciate this, you know, after a great deal of convincing, I mean, even the fire alarms were hidden in this space, <laughs> right? I mean, it's a space that was challenging to get the entire museum on board with this idea that we cannot break character in Mrs. M's cabinet. This is her cabinet. It is not our 21st century. Cabinet. Her cabinet also explicitly employs historic interpretive strategies to present the objects in her gallery, and at the same time, contests and complicates those strategies by using them to create a fuller picture of the past. All of the ways visitors engage with the 17th century, um, and just some of the books that we have in the space, all of the ways that visitors engage with the 17th century museum objects in the space align with historic modes of interacting with interiors. In addition to the Pepper's ghost illusion through which Mrs. M introduces herself and which is referencing um, theatrical history, all of the labels and additional text in her ledger book shown here or in her scrapbook elsewhere in the space, which are alternative labeling strategies also accessible online, are handwritten by a local calligrapher who is the hand of Mrs. M. The text here is in Mrs. M's voice, not that of a modern curator along with watercolor sketches of each item, which we worked with an artist to create these uh, watercolor sketches. The ledger notes that a particular dish might be Ottoman, not Turkish. Describes objects as a careful collector might. A Spanish charger with a pensive young man around 1650. Or a, remarkable a remarkably tiny Chinese porcelain wine cup. Such a precious thing to be part of such a hard life in 17th century Jamestown, Virginia where wine cups like that were found. As such, the objects are given a fuller life by understanding them in relation to a person who valued them, something that doesn't often happen in museum collections. Mrs. M's research on ceramics found in Jamestown, Virginia, helps her make the rhetorical claim that she presents about material diversity in early America, as well as a larger point about the importance of object-based epistemology as a key way to understand how objects have been used to make arguments about the world historically. And you can access all of this online, should you be so inclined. Mrs. M didn't have this opportunity, but we do. The basic purpose of Mrs. M's cabinet is to present and interpret historic objects in a manner that more actively considers meaning and cultural complexity. 
In the cabinet, things inhabit three different historical moments. The moment they were created, the moment she chose to collect and or display them, and of course, the present. And this chronological layering emphasizes the ways all of the objects on display in museums have their own biographies and are in fact time, are in effect time travelers. Like every other object in the museum, the things in this gallery were saved because of the choices people made about their cultural, historical, or aesthetic value at different moments. And her scrapbook, shown here, includes a range of 19th century sources that visitors may page through to understand how Mrs. M accessed and studied this history. Overall, the gallery operates on the conceit that Mrs. M exists. She is present in the Pepper's Ghost illusion, in the notes in her scrapbook, in her ledger, as well as in the design of the room and the intellectual contents of her collection. These clues establish a few principles about her character, particularly her historical context and how she uses the world. We learn that she uses objects as evidence. She questions authority. She is both adventurous and empathetic. And we look to historic examples like US textbook author Mary Sheldon Barnes, the Alice Baker of Deerfield, US historian of decorative arts Alice Morse Early, and others to help us ground Mrs. M in this late 19th century context. But she is in her cabinet especially present in her ongoing work. Visitors may peer in on her research left sitting on her desk, piercing the fourth wall of the exhibition by showing her work in progress. The hope is that these approaches make visitors more aware of the subjective nature of her display and others, past and present, in period rooms and throughout the larger museum in which this cabinet is located thinking about relationships among material things, curatorial perspectives, and visitor experiences. So what kind of pedagogy does this cabinet make possible? The expansiveness and curiosity of Mrs. M's character allows for varied modes of interpretation, which really invite collaboration. Last fall, my graduate seminar, Curating Mrs. M's World at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, in that seminar, my students investigated her story her organizing principles, what may be termed the category of Mrs. M, to create new installations for seven historic objects chosen from the collection. They thought not only about the art historical arguments they hoped to make, but how they could make a meaningful claim through Mrs. M's worldview. And then they had the additional stakes of knowing these objects would be on display in a big public museum, in the Milwaukee Art Museum. So they really had to do a good job, which thankfully they did. For example, one of my students used the language of the flowers to critique a vase which was intended to celebrate the centennial in 1876, something that it was hard for them to imagine Mrs. M would really want to celebrate. So we put together a bouquet, presenting it with sunflowers that may stand in for false riches, thorn apple for deceitful charms, and scarlet geranium for stupidity, thinking about a veiled way this object might be critiqued in the context of her space. Other installations emphasized her ingenuity, suggesting she certainly would have uh, employed the latest x-ray technology in the late 19th century to study something like an African-American memory jug, or to approach something like a puzzle jug, basically an historic drinking game, as an opportunity for a schematic drawing, thinking about how liquid actually moved through this strange and rather tricky vessel, as well as many other collaborations I don't have time to talk about today, including artist collaborations. The students built upon these stories through her log, through which they were able to um, you know, talk about and write about what they were doing um, online for visitors to be able to read. They also were able to write about this and share this through the Milwaukee Art Museum's more public blog. And we also created a video, which if you're curious, you can check out on Chipstone's Art Babble page, in which my students talk about these interventions and what they're trying to accomplish by curating with Mrs. M. In the gallery, her calling cards, which you can pick up, invite visitors to connect with all the material online to read the log, or even, should you wish, to download your own paper doll-sized version of her cabinet so you too can have your own Mrs. M's cabinet at home that you could print out and um, engage with yourself. It's actually kind of fun to do. I know this is a room that loves rooms. 
As a result of this interpretation, as, excuse me, as a result of this, <clears throat> the result of this interpretation is a museum-based project that is both purposeful and open-ended, and we view those two goals as complementary at Chipstone. This intellectually capacious style is key to understanding Mrs. M's cabinet's pedagogical possibilities, and as I, I think about it in other contexts, also the feminist possibilities of a period room like this, a project like this. Because it's taking seriously alternative modes of history making, this project emphasizes the variety of stories that are available um, to curators, and it's open source. It's quite explicitly open source. The curatorial team, graduate students, artists, colleagues continue to work with us to develop Mrs. M's story through a variety of different kinds of research and making projects. And throughout, Mrs. M's cabinet uses the rhetoric of the historic interior to do this work. It allows us at the Chipstone Foundation to explore how history is told, who is allowed to tell it, what makes a story true, and how objects and domestic interiors can make multiple truths legible. My brief case study today only begins to share the interpretive and programmatic initiatives happening in the cabinet. We often host historical salons in there, we bring in school groups, we often have performances, and there actually are a few artists currently making work for Mrs. M. 18 months into this project, her cabinet has unexpectedly become Chipstone's primary changing gallery, one which we curate along with an historical character interested in object-based research and the cultural and ethical stakes of doing history in an art museum. The cabinet both illustrates and facilitates the creation of new historical interpretations Interpretations that shape the way we teach with and through the time-traveling historic objects in all of our museum collections. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much for this opportunity to uh, participate in today's event. It's been really inspiring and, and interesting, and I appreciate the opportunity to contribute my story. When I was a kid, my family lived in a split-level house, a suburban house. Beneath the stairs was a storage area that we called the cubby hole, where uh, I would squirrel myself away as the middle child and play. On the sides of boxes, I drew the switches and instruments of a space shuttle flight deck using manuals such as this. And pushing those buttons and observing those instruments, I pretended a future escaping the Earth and flying back home. The, the cubby hole's cramped dimensions and dim lighting helped me forget where I was, and awareness of time and the calls of siblings and parents faded away. I had no idea then that I was not alone in my efforts to imagine flight from inside the home. In fact, at almost the same time, around 1980, a computer engineer and entrepreneur named Bruce Artwick released the first flight simulator program for home computers opening the door to a mass market culture of virtual aviation. His first experiments also led to the construction of innumerable cockpit facsimiles, some indistinguishable, as we'll see, from their Boeing and Airbus counterparts in basements and bedrooms around the world. During the next few minutes, I'd like to explore how aviation enthusiasts and real-life pilots have created spaces in the home to simulate flight. In keeping with our theme today, I will pay particular attention to the work these spaces do to immerse their occupants and users in imagined worlds and how they fit, how these simulators fit within past and current understandings of the home. Within a few years of the Wright brothers' success at Kitty Hawk, aviators were seeking ways to teach and practice flight under controlled conditions. As would be the case throughout flight simulation history, the military often led the way. William Ruggles' 1917 orientator acclimated trainees to the sensation of moving through the air in any direction relative to the horizon. It featured a rudimentary cockpit set upon a gimbal that could also be controlled from a ground-based ground -based instructor station. So both the pilot, the trainee pilot, and the instructor could both control this simulator. A more influential design was Edwin Link's Link Trainer, a cockpit supported atop a compressed air bellows adapted from his father's organ factory 
in Binghamton, New York. Regularly improved and its capabilities expanded, the link trainer was credited with reducing the time that, uh, that it took pilots to become ready for instrument training and was adapted and used by uh, almost all of the different air forces that participated in World War II on both sides of the conflict. With the explosive growth of passenger flight after the war, the rise of larger and more complicated aircraft, and ac acute shortage of uh, pilots, commercial aviation also pushed advancements in flight simulation. But these civil and military si simulators were all located on military bases and at airline training centers. In 1958, Popular Mechanics featured 18-year-old Jimmy Holden and his four classmates who constructed a simulator in the basement of Holden's suburban Seattle house. The group wired together donated and salvaged equipment in a close enough model of a four-engine turboprop plane to be able to recreate the, all of the procedures that a real-life pilot would encounter or would engage in, from radioing the tower, taxiing, navigating, uh, flying through uh, flying through the air, all in real time, and all the way down to landing and uh, returning back to the, the, um, to the airport. The, um, a decade later, the same magazine, Popular Mechanics, featured a home flight simulator invented by another uh, uh, individual from Seattle, physician William Duncan. It used compressed air from an old paint compressor, along with a complicated arrangement of surgical tubing and fish aquarium valves to drive, a cock <laughs> to drive the cockpit instruments. So this is uh, Dr. Duncan with his son in the, uh, in the pilot seat. He's behind with this apparatus that would allow him to trace the route, the trajectory that his son was flying on a, on a sectional map, on an aerial map. Uh, he was a general aviation pilot himself, and he hoped to get his children interested in flying. Uh, he was successful. Some of his, his children did become pilots themselves, but he also packaged this as a kit and sold it as a, a DIY instructional guide. Uh, and according to his family, sold several, thousands, several thousand of these by mail. In the 1960s and 70s, a few companies developed consumer-oriented simulator packages powered by solid-state electronics. Advertisements positioned the ATC 510 explicitly within the domestic realm, likening it to the size of a television and photographing it among books in a home study. Yet it was only in the 1980s that flight simulation expanded its purchase in popular culture and the home, evolving from a training mechanism almost exclusively for pilots to be and for trainees, to, form, to a form of entertainment for those interested in aviation, but n might not have any intention of flying an actual Cessna or a 747, either through financial restrictions, uh, health considerations, and so on, or age. The primary te technological developments that made this shift possible were the, flight, were the personal computer and, the consumer, and consumer flight simulation software. Bruce Artwick's flight simulator attracted the attention of Bill Gates, and his new company, Microsoft, uh, began a collaboration with Artwick. In, 90, in 1983, Microsoft released their first version of the, programs, of the program for PCs. By showcasing the processing and graphic power of the personal computer, as illustrated <laughs> in this image, uh, Microsoft hoped Flight Simulator would stimulate consumer acceptance of and demand for home computers at a time when most saw them as office equipment. Over the next 25 years and 12 iterations, Flight Simulator became one of Microsoft's most popular titles, selling over 10 million copies. Today, three companies dominate the consumer flight sim market. They're joined by hundreds of third-party add-on software companies and the manufacturers of peripherals, so the joysticks and the, the rudder pedals uh, and various other components that, that can be incorporated into this. So, as you can see from the latest iteration of X-Plane 11, which came out uh, earlier this year, the graphic capabilities of the uh, computers have expanded exponentially, and the ability to recreate these environments for the virtual pilots has expanded. Many home simulators go no further than they add uh, to their desk a joystick or maybe some rudder pedals or a second monitor. Even a few peripherals provide a more enriched tactile experience of taking off, navigating, and landing than just a keyboard and mouse alone. 
but I'm especially interested in the more elaborate setups that substantially transform the character of the space in which they're located. These flight decks may include plug-and-play components that are purchased off the shelf, or homemade versions with switches, knobs, and displays obtained from retailers and then wired to mi microprocessors that then translate the, the, um, the signals into the flight simulator and then the flight simulator responds by moving uh, the scenery around and, and so on. Uh, or they might adapt instruments and controls salvaged from actual decommissioned aircrafts like the teenager Holden did back in the 1950s, although he had no simulator software or uh, PC, of course, to, to hook it up to. Their experience as flight simulators was entirely um, tactile and contained within the cockpit. There was no representation of the landscape or the, the scenery through which they were flying. Home flight decks can be found in just about every space within the domestic uh, space, bedrooms, occupied or spared, or sorry, occupied or spare, and finished and unfinished basements are perhaps the most common. I've seen others situated in garages or dedicated backyard sheds. Less frequent are living rooms, particularly in multi-member households where the location of these always has to be negotiated, uh, and alcoves within the kitchen. The integration of, flight simula of the flight simulator and the home, the dynamic of being simultaneously in the dwelling and apart from it, is an essential element of Simming's appeal. A New York Times article profiling the hobby describes a simulated night flight over Connecticut and the virtual pilot's anxiety about whether to press on or stop for refueling. Instead, the author writes, quote, I hit pause and get up from my desk and head to the kitchen for a sandwich. <laughs> Wherever its location within the dwelling, Simmer, Simmers often takes steps to modify the space in a way that facilitates the sense of immersion and isolation from the room in which it's located. The easiest means to achieve this is simply to turn off the lights and just let the illumination from the controls and, and from the monitors uh, provide that experience. Fiberboard panels framed with PVC pipes suffice for some. Others construct a space that mirrors the exact contours of the cockpit that they're, they're uh, imagining flying. Simmers interviewed for this project agreed that creating some type of enclosure was an essential step in enhancing their sense of immersion. One remarked, nothing wrecks immersion like looking up from a landing and seeing your washer, dryer, and your laundry detergent. <laughs> Peak immersion is equivalent to what theorists call flow state or the zone, a combination of focus, empowerment, and pleasure. One cockpit builder said the outward evidence of such immersion confirming that his simulator has gotten as exact and as realistic as possible was that his, his invited co-pilots would get uh, airsick, would become nauseous. The home simulator cockpit is a space that embodies a series of contradictions. It is both stable and precarious, fictional and real, ephemeral and enduring. Thomas Harvinen, in his insights about how players construct a play space within the real world during live action role-playing games, can be applied to home flight simulation. The players that he studies deploy various strategies to, quote, maximize disturbances to the illusion, or minimize, sorry, disturbances to the illusion of play, and to preserve the boundaries of the game. According to Harvinen, the blunting rejection of unwelcome information is extensively utify, u, utilized, often instinctively, especially by strongly immersed players, to protect them from potential content that would be disruptive and situationally non-relevant. So the creation of these capsules, these um, cockpits, and their location within a uh, room within a room in these enclosures is essential to this process of weeding out um, information and sensory experiences and, and so on that don't contribute to the, the, the illusion of flight. Yet any membrane separating simulation from the world outside remains permeable. Life, social conditions, and larger cultural ideas work their way into the experience, sometimes insidiously, sometimes invited. The flight simmer might be imagined as a solitary tinkerer, frivolously spending time and money pretending in a darkened basement. The characteri this characterization, though, says much about the ambivalence Americans have long felt about play in general and digital play in particular. But flight simulation is both surprisingly communal and well aligned with age-old expectations for the worthwhile use of free time within the home. 
Many virtual pilots connect to online networks where they interact with other pilot simmers and a cohort of virtual air traffic controllers. This was a screen grab from this morning from a network called IVAO. I forget what it means, uh, but these are actual flight simulation pilots. At 7 o'clock this morning, I, I grabbed this from my hotel room, and all, each one of the planes represents somebody around the world sitting in their cockpit or at their desk, flying a little plane, and being controlled uh, in the best case scenarios by virtual air traffic controllers. You can see which networks are online here by these hatched areas. Europe, it was later in the day in Europe, so there are many more controllers online in that part of the world and many more planes also active. There were 631 pilots today and 44 controllers on the line, on, online. They also participate in online forums like cockpit cockpitbuilders.com, attend conferences and workshops, and uh, post to message boards and, and uh, Reddit subs and so on, sharing the frustrations and successes of constructing, modifying, and using their flight decks. Interview subjects regularly mention the importance of having friends and family serve as flight crew, imparting an enthusiasm for aviation, and partnering up for an evening trip to Paris or Hong Kong. Like the basement recreation room with ping, ping pong table or home theater screen, the flight simulator is a modern hearth around which family and friends gather for shared experience, for relaxation, and for play. The simulator constitutes a social environment that structures the meaning of these acti activities and these spaces. As with other types of home-based recreation, flight simulation accommodates the twin views of the home as a place of both refuge and relaxation and a place for hobbies that foster earnest self-improvement. They enable escape to just about any airport in the world, some that no longer exist. Uh, in Hong Kong, for example, Meg's Field in Chicago. They also reenact historic flights. You can download a, a uh, model of the Spirit of St. Louis and recreate uh, Lindbergh's flight. There's uh, all kinds of airplanes that, that uh, are no longer around or are very uh, rare. Flight simmers also build uh, scenery themselves and contribute them to a shared uh, publicly accessible gateway. So this is actually um, Logan Airport that was designed and donated as freeware for anybody that was, that's flying X-Plane. And you can get down and see all the cracks in the runway and all the rest of this. Um, they also design um, planes themselves and attempt to accurately model the flight characteristics of that and so, those and so on. Home flight simulators expand their knowledge of aerodynamics, meteorology, navigation, radio communication procedures, and so on. They develop woodworking, 3D printing, electronics, wiring, and programming skills. When simulated flying or work on the cockpit produces, in, or in, uh, produces and engenders flow, it also reinforces traditional understandings of the role home and uh, the role of home and hobby as refuge and as restorative. The flight deck then shares a spot within the dwelling parallel to that of the home workshop, the woodworking workshop, the practice room for musical instruments, the sewing room, or even just spaces within uh, the interior reserved for those activities. Um, at, these are all spaces of productive pastimes, personal growth, and creative es escape from the pressures of the world outside. Scholars have focused on the social and psychological boundaries of play and the representation of space within the computer game, but have paid considerably less attention to the physical site where play takes place. A predominant and contentious characterization of this zone is the magic circle introduced by uh, Johann Hausiga and later elaborated upon by Eric Zimmerman and Katie Salen. He sees the magic circle as a temporary world within the ordinary world. The flight sim co cockpit represents or re resembles, sorry, the card tables, the tennis courts, and theater stages that he considers playgrounds characterized by order. Into an imperfect world and into the confusion of life, play and playgrounds bring a, quote, temporary, a limited perfection. Because they are part of and apart from ordinary home life, and because they are sites of play, simming cockpits can be useful lenses through which to view considerations of the domestic realm. Jaco Stenros says that, quote, play helps us perceive things from alternative angles and in a different light. 
It helps us engage with our surroundings in new ways as we perceive and break norms and routines. He continues, play and games serve as an alibi. As they are perceived as being somehow less, we can get away with more. Flight simulators look forward. They anticipate each new technological development. They anticipate each new technological development in simulator design as steps towards either ever enhanced immersive experiences. New practices and tools, especially virtual reality, will no doubt continue to change how flight simulation engages the spaces where it occurs. While the presence of a high-tech 737 cockpit within a bedroom or a basement might seem out of place or incongruous, while it might seem like a jarring tear in the domestic realm, and while it might seem like just a kid or a play space for kids in cubby holes, the way that flight simulators reinforce established notions of recreation and the appropriate use of free time within them is wholly fitting. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for your wonderful papers. Um, it was um, really a pleasure to hear all the different ways in which you are trying to bring into a room another reality. And I, as I was listening to um, the three of you, I, was, I had two ideas in my mind. And one is, as Laura said, um, keeping in, in mind the philosophy chamber, uh, one of the, when we start discussing about the display of the philosophy chamber and how to go about that, um, we couldn't um, stop thinking that the real philosophy chamber and the real Harbor Hall is still in campus. So how would we um, negotiate that situation that we have the real thing there, the real space that we are now trying to recreate in a new building for, with a youth in a museum context? But the other question that um, prompted me your different um, approaches um, is about this idea of enclosure and um, inhabiting uh, a new, a, a different world, recreating a different world. And um, as I was listening to that, I was thinking about um, you're trying different strategies to do that, uh, to create a virtual reality. But the way technology goes nowadays is that um, you can, by just wearing one of those 3D helmets, you would be immediately uh, in a different space. And the th one thing that the three of your papers, to my thinking, share is how the space, the room, uh, the, arc the actual space is so strongly linked, even though you're trying to create a different reality. So just bringing back the question that Louis Nelson was addressing us yesterday, why the room matters. Uh, would you think that you could be able to achieve the same goals that you are trying in your different proposals just by using a helmet? I mean, like, would a cockpit be to still be a cockpit mm -hmm. uh, without having all your uh, joysticks and all these things in the same room just by wearing them? Or would you just uh, be able to recreate Mrs. M's um, character and cabinet by using complete 3D reality? Um, I don't know. I would say no. Mm -hmm. I think part of what makes Mrs. M's cabinet interesting for us is that it's a space that one can walk into, you can sit down, you can look closely at things, you can engage with the objects on display. And for us, one of our key purposes in creating that space was to display our historic objects. And so while those objects are available online, I think there is something meaningful about having the historical material things, the 17th century objects that we collect, on display for you to look at and think about in a different kind of context. And so it, I think there's something quite special about walking into that space, about feeling confused in a way, like where am I? What's going on here? What are connections that I can make between these objects and the space? What are connections that I can make between the space and the gallery before it, which was also a gallery we created, which is quite purposely, it's actually our, our Cosmos gallery, which is constellation themed and it has a very, very cool lighting. It, feels very 2001 Space Odyssey, kind of the opposite of Mrs. M's cabinet, a contrast that's purposeful. So I think there's something that is very physical and very embodied that's necessary for that space maybe to work. People can touch and look closely and sit down and it feels different. Plus we've worked with many craftspeople to create that space. I mean, almost everything in there is handmade, which is one of the beauties of working in Milwaukee. We have amazing craftspeople who we could work with on that project. Mm -hmm. 
So that's part of it too. Okay. I would say in answer to the question about uh, simulation, the, it depends on who, what, what the person going in is looking for. If they are just trying to um, recreate uh, sort of the experience of flight on, on a certain level, you can see the scenery, you can move around with one of these VR helmets in a way that you can't do now, and, and it's kind of awkward to look into a monitor or something that's small mm -hmm. and see what, what you want to be seeing in every direction. And when you have those helmets on, you can't do that. But the people that I, I was looking at that are more involved in building these apparatus, and they're debating this issue too. A lot of them were originally sort of scared by Hi. seeing this technology that might come <laughs> and, and supplant something that they've spent hundreds or thousands of hours building. And, and I think there was a, a, some concern about that. But it comes down to sort of what Sarah was saying about the tactility of these, mm -hmm. the opportunity to touch things, and the importance of the feel of it. Right, the, there are in, in many of these people go to enormous lengths to find these parts. They love how they smell. They love how they look old. They love that they actually flew for thousands of hours around the world, and now they've had this sort of second life in in their home. And you can't replace that using VR yet. Maybe there'll be a time where you actually get some sort of response from those controllers. But right now, it's it's still at a pretty clumsy stage from my limited understanding of of the actual contact with it. And, and there is also that sense of, of a shared experience that you don't get when you're in okay. the VR environment, right? As I mentioned in the talk, it's really important to a lot of them to have that second seat and to have that be a space where somebody else can come in and share this as a, as a shared experience. Would you like to Yes, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I think what, I think in a way the kind of I think the kind of function that Nelson imagined could only exist in a virtual representation, which I almost take that axonometric drawing to be, and particularly the kind of hovering, um, sort of decorporealized viewer of such a thing in which you're sort of floating above a, a kind of rotating imagination of space. Um, I, don't, I would be very curious to know what it would have been like if that space had actually been attempted to be built, because I imagine it would be a lot messier and stranger even um, than that drawing um, suggests. And, I, and, and so later in his career, um, you know, this is early on um, in his career, but when he gets past his sort of experimental projects and builds buildings, um, he's actually much more concerned with these sort of material properties of the building and the effect that they have. Um, on the human body. So at Saint Lo, the, the, the hospital whose mm -hmm. surgery room I showed at the end, he's using, uh, he has Leger make a mural, he's using color on the wall as a way of thinking about um, the color's effect on the body um, and on the sort of mood of the patients. And so I think he's much more attentive to um, haptic experience than the, the sort of diagram would suggest he, that he was. Okay, good. So you all agree. Um, does anybody um, have any questions? Want to? Yes, Mongo. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on that thread of the sort of sociability, um, which struck me very powerfully. Uh, and just particularly think of Mrs. M's space. Of course, notably, she's not there, okay. and yet one of the wonderful experiences of going into a space put together by a private collector is the enthusiasm with which the private collector will do something that none of us who work in museums will ever do. They'll go up to a shelf and pick up an object and mm. say, look, can you feel that? Just yeah. turn it over and all the rest of it. And I'm just wondering how you have negotiated yourselves through that bit that our professional existence just won't let us do and, and in fact how you negotiate your way through the inevitability of Mrs. M's absence even if she's there in that um, little recreation. It's a great question. In a very practical way, um, at the end of her Pepper's Ghost Illusion, she explains that she's in Mexico hunting for rare redwares, which is something that we're actually thinking <laughs> of adding to the space. Um, and so that's where she is when you visit the cabinet. But she um, it depends on who we're with. I spend a lot of time in Mrs. M's cabinet on the weekends, pushing the stroller, 
people don't assume I'm the curator. I'm observing, I'm listening, asking questions. So I'm often in that space undercover, trying to understand how people are engaging with it, asking questions, listening, and that adds to various edits and revisions in the cabinet. But when I'm in there as, as the curator, or as a curator who collaborates with Mrs. M, as I often introduce myself, like, oh yes, we're working with Mrs. M, she's, yes, she's this person that sometimes I'll admit that we've created her, sometimes I won't. It's, some, it's a game that my colleagues and I play to sort of think through, depending on who we're with in the space. But we often find ourselves talking about um, how spaces can tell stories. Like, what can you learn about Mrs. M just from this cabinet that I'm not telling you? You can look at her work, you can pick up her calling card, you can look at the books on her shelf. We have various things hidden in this space, what I guess um, video gamers would call like Easter eggs. They're things that you can engage with in the space that we don't tell people about, that they can find one of those books, you pull it off the shelf, but actually begins a secret program inside of the wall that one of my students created where you peer inside and you see sort of another narrative that starts up, there are bells that you can ring that will maybe bring Mrs. M, maybe she will come downstairs, maybe she won't. So we leave lots of clues in that space. And so there's an element of a mystery, an element of a story, but not one with a clear beginning or a clear end. So she is a presence in the space and one that we engage with in lots of different kinds of playful ways. But you can always pick up her calling card and you can go read her log and learn more about her that way. That's a good job. Um. Thank you for all of your presentations. I've been thinking about Mrs. M's cabinet uh, constantly since you presented because I can't help but um, having a comparison in my mind with um, other models that play with authenticity and fictionality like Mrs. Uh, M's uh, cabinet, but in a different realm, maybe enter entertainment in particular. I just finished a book by Sher Crow's Knight about Disney World and she um, talks about exactly like this, um, being into the characters. This is an art historian that um, discusses Disney World as an art history, uh, you know, through an art historical filter. And she uh, talks about uh, the fact that um, the uh, actors and actresses that participate in that realm uh, are not supposed to go out of character, just like you're not going out of character when you are uh, in the context of the room, and the uh, visitors participate in the stories, are familiar with the stories of the characters that uh, are supposed to inhabit the spaces in that fictional construction. Uh, so there is, in fact, an idea of like even going to Disney World as a way of going to a pilgrimage site, as going to a place that can recreate a, a connection with stories that we're used to. Um, so. What I um, am curious about is the reception of uh, Mrs. M's cabinet beyond the uh, structured exercises that you can construct with graduate students or with uh, specific groups of visitors because I'm thinking about the context, the experiential context in which the typical uh, 21st century visitor can um, immerse herself, the visitor that comes to that room, will have in mind the um, Walt Disney World, most likely Walt Disney World you know, model, uh, will have in mind a different kind of recreational model that functions uh, in a way that is a, lit, a, a lot more static and less authentic, maybe in different ways at least, than what you're trying to propose. So is there a confusion between, you know, like for the viewer, this is a fictional space or is it not? And if not, how do you signal that it's not a fictional space? Well, I, I think there probably is a little bit of confusion and I, um, both pedagogically as a professor and as a curator, I don't think confusion is always a bad thing. I think it can often be extremely productive. And so oftentimes, as long as um, it's not frustrating, but I think a little bit of confusion can be a wonderful thing. So oftentimes, visitors will come in like, what is this place? So look around. They might, hopefully, will pull the cord, and then the story begins. If they don't pull the cord, if they don't engage, if they don't page through the careful ledger books that we've put together, they often just think, oh, this is a period room, or oh, this is a really lovely space, or oh, this is interesting. It's also a place where they can sit down. Oddly, in the museum in which we're located, there are very few places to sit down. Mm -hmm. So it's a comfortable place <laughs> yeah. to spend time. People are often in there sitting, talking. The security guards at the art museum 
are always hanging out in Mrs. M's cabinet, which I take as a very good sign. <laughs> yeah. It's a good place yeah. just to kind of, it has a very good feeling to it. So people are often spending time when they're looking closely at things, you know, paging through ledger books. But if they don't choose to engage, there's no one telling them, this is what is happening in this space. And if you look at how people engage with most museum galleries, if you don't read the labels, if you don't actually engage with objects, there's no one telling you, this is what is happening in this space. You're making assumptions based on you know, a history of visiting museums. And so we don't, we're not prescriptive in that way. It's not as if you walk in, there's someone saying, you are now entering a period room created by the Chipstone Foundation who are interested in museum, museum subjectivity. That doesn't happen. Like you walk in, you're like, oh, this is kind of cool. You can sit down, you can read, you can engage. And so that's what happens. So it works on multiple levels. It works on a level, hopefully, for visitors. It also works on a different kind of level for graduate students and for people interested in critical museum pedagogy and practice, as I think many of us are. Yeah. Okay, I think we can have one more question. Um, maybe there, the gentleman there. That's not it. Um, so uh, I'm really kind of curious about uh, all of these spaces that, that actually we've talked about today have a sort of this convenient fiction uh, that they express somehow, and the, the redemptive qualities of participating in that, um, it, you know, it's kind of part of the story. Um, but I'm kind of curious about the inconvenient parts of creating these spaces. Um, it, I was wondering if you could comment on, on that. Doing the research, actually physically making them, um, and, the, and the kinds of tasks that are involved. Sure, it's a great question, and it's one that um, came up a lot in my research because I, I frame it in terms of the sitting down and flying, but for many of the people that are engaging in this hobby, the building of that and the rebuilding of that is really the hobby that is more important to them than the actual flying. And they often say that they don't even get to fly. And they're often not in a condition where they can because things are taken apart and moved around. So it's similar to um, model railroaders who also build these in their basements and in many of the same sorts of spaces that will build it and then not even complete it and actually may not even really run it, but will get to a point where they're, they lose interest or they've found something new that they want to model and will re tear it apart and rebuild it again. So this process is, I think, really uh, an essential and important part. The other uh, an important part of the hobby, the other component of, of that is that of the sort of inconvenience of these things is, as I alluded to, these are often in co-occupied spaces where the, they have to be negotiated. So I didn't include a slide, but there's um, one that was posted on Reddit of these of a couple, and he has a cockpit that he built that folds into a trunk. <laughs> and then it, it sort of expands like a transformer, and monitors pop up, and the doors pop open. And he said it had to, I forget what, he, what the criteria was, but it had to essentially not look like what it was. And it could fold into this piece of furniture. And it was in the same room, a, a spare bedroom in the home that he shares with his, his wife, who has a sewing space right next to his. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, there's, there's definitely um, some inconvenience in smaller spaces where, or where multiple people live, and, and these have to be negotiated. <laughs> sure, I mean, I think um, the inconvenience <clears throat> faced in studying, um, I think, a room that never existed um, <laughs> is kind of, it's both convenient and inconvenient, because I can project, to use the word I was using a lot, anything I want on it because it, it only really exists in my imagination, but it exists in the, in the sort of representational um, fiction. Um, but I do think there is a way in which um, the kind of deferred, um, the sort of deferred desire to sort of visit a space um, can be a kind of inconvenience because this, this book kind of elicits this, I think as you were saying, a kind of fantasy um, it's, it's a quite a large book and it has these incredibly detailed plans of heliotherapy baths and where all the offices are and where the furnaces are and where the servants and where all the doctors live. And the whole sort of space is, is, um, is, is elaborated and there's a kind of like melancholy, I think, to this um, elaboration um, that is never quite um, achieved, even in its kind of virtual representation. 
Well, thank you very much. So we will reconvene here. Thank you very much um, for your contribution, for your questions. That has been um, an excellent conversation date. And we will reconvene here at 3.45 for uh, final uh, conclusions and remarks. Okay, thank you. Thank you.